Good morning and welcome to online worship at Highland Church of the Nazarene. Because of the cold weather, we're not able to gather together, but we still want to have a time where we can celebrate who the Lord is and what he's done in our lives. So we pray that this time will be beneficial for you, but most importantly, that, that Jesus Christ our Lord will be lifted up. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we are so blessed to be your children and to be able to, to share your love, your grace, and your mercy through online worship today. Uh, even though this is not what we prefer, Lord, we know that you've promised that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, whether that's here physically or wherever people are watching this, Lord, uh, that you will be there in their midst. And Lord, that's what we want more than anything this morning, is just to lift you up and to be with you. Would you be with us as we lift up your name, Jesus, and worship you? It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
this morning. Amen.
trust in for our salvation. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus had these words to his disciples in the 14th chapter in the Gospel of John. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house are so many rooms. It is, if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. And you know where I'm going, but then Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then Jesus said these words. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. But then Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. A little bit later, Jesus goes on to promise his Holy Spirit. And we know through the rest of the gospel what Jesus did. He went on to suffer and to die on the cross. But then on the third day, he was raised again. And he's still alive, and he's coming back uh, for his people someday. That is our living hope. Jesus Christ is our living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not fly in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace See you. 
Thank you for your spirit, Lord, that dwells in us, that not only seals us with the promise of your salvation, Lord, but empowers us to live a holy life. Lord, I just pray that uh, you would continue to be with us today as we declare to all the world that you are worthy of all blessing and glory and honor and worship. Thank you, Jesus, not just for what you've done, but Lord, just for who you are. Thank you, Lord. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he 
This is Pastor Ron from the Church of the Nazarene in Highland, Indiana. Uh, really glad to be with you today. Um, I was thinking about that this morning. We didn't expect to be with you today, but uh, we have freezing cold temperatures, in fact, uh, below zero wind chills in our area, and didn't want to take a chance with our people getting out and take a chance with them getting hurt and something happening. So we chose to uh, not have service today and chose to do this video for them and for you. So we're really glad to have you with us. Um, I was thinking as I was getting ready for the video, my wife has uh, made a list of the different states where we know uh, people have watched us. Uh, there are t people from 25 different states in the United States who have watched our videos. We're so thankful for that and so glad to have you with us. And then even some people from a group in South Africa who watch our videos. So we're very thankful for how the Lord is using the videos, and we're very, very thankful you're watching us today. I want to talk to you about something today that you already know about. Normally, I try to talk to you about something that might be new for you or something you might not be aware of or something like that. But today, I want to talk to you about something you already know about, uh, unless you're not a Christian or you didn't grow up in church and aren't familiar with spiritual battles, I want to talk to you about there is a spiritual war going on. And I know when I say that to you, I know that you already know that. But what I want to know is, do you know what to do about that? And if you've been in a spiritual battle lately in recent months or last year, how did you do? Did you win the battle or did you lose the battle? Um, did you let God give you victory or did the devil defeat you? Um, sometimes when we've been Christians for a while, we get a little overconfident and think we know what we're doing and think we can make it on our own and uh, find out we're not as strong as we thought we were 
And uh, sometimes we get beat up pretty good. So we don't want that to happen to you. Um, we want you to know about spiritual wars and battles. Uh, we want you to understand them. We want you to know what to do. And we want you to be able to do better the next time. I was thinking yesterday about the story about the lion in the jungle. If you've known me very long, you know it's one of my favorite stories. Um, there was a lion that was pretty proud of himself. And he was uh, going out in the jungle and prowling around in the jungle and walking up to other animals and kind of strutting his stuff. And he looked up at a giraffe and said, Mr. Giraffe, who's the king of the jungle? And the giraffe looked down and said, oh, Mr. Lion, you're the king of the jungle. There's no doubt about that. And the lion said, very good, Mr. Giraffe. That's the right answer. And the lion went through the jungle a little ways and found a monkey. And he said, Mr. Monkey, who's the toughest animal in the jungle? And the monkey said, oh, Mr. Lion, you're the strongest animal in the jungle. You're the most fierce animal. Nobody would ever mess with you. And the lion said, very, very good. Very good, Mr. Monkey. That's the right answer. The lion was walking out into a field where there was some straw. And uh, there was a herd of elephants uh, swishing their trunks through the straw and eating the straw. And he walked up to the biggest bull elephant in the entire group and said, hey, who's the king of the jungle? And the elephant ignored him, just ignored him. And he said again, hey, I'm talking to you. And the elephant paid no attention to him. So the lion went over and bumped him and said, listen to me, I'm talking to you. Who's the king of the jungle? And without saying a word, the elephant took his trunk and wrapped his trunk around the chest cage of the lion and picked him up and took him over to a tree and slammed him into the tree and broke his rib cage and left him laying in a heap at the bottom of the tree. And the lion just walked away without saying anything. And the, excuse me, the elephant walked away and the lion looked up from laying there in a heap and said, my goodness, you didn't have to get so mad just because you didn't know the answer to the question. The lion thought that he was something that he wasn't. He thought he was stronger than he was. He thought he was more capable than he was. And he found out that he wasn't what he thought he was. You don't want to do that as a Christian. You don't want to find out you're not as strong as you thought you were. You don't want to find out you're not doing as well as you thought you were. You want to find out that you are capable to win your spiritual battles. So I'm going to read to you out of the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, starting at verse 10. Ephesians 6 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Remember that word, the schemes of the devil, the tricks of the devil. For our struggle, our battle, is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers against the world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all that, take up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows or the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and with prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with perseverance and per petition for all the saints. Several things that God wants us to do to win our spiritual battles. I want us to start out, if you have a little piece of paper, I want you to write down the letters U-P-S 
underneath each other. U-P-S, like United Parcel Service. And you can remember three simple things from UPS. U is understand spiritual wars and battles. If you're going to win your spiritual battles, you're going to have to understand spiritual battles. There are two or three places that spiritual battles come from. Number one is there is a spiritual war going on between God and Satan. When Satan was an angel and rebelled against God and tried to overthrow God, God cast him out of heaven and he is bound for hell. Satan hates God, but Satan just doesn't hate God. Satan hates Christians and Satan hates Christian families and Satan hates churches and Satan hates countries that would like to be a Christian nation. So Satan wants to defeat you, and he wants to defeat your family, and he wants to defeat our church and every other church that's preaching the Bible, and he certainly wants to defeat our country and every other country in the world. That war is real. It is real. There's no doubt about it. It's as real as anything you can touch or feel. So I want you to remember that. Satan hates you, wants not only to defeat you, he wants to destroy you for eternity. Another place that spiritual battles come from is through your sinful nature being in conflict with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Galatians 5.17, your sinful nature is in conflict with the Holy Spirit, and you end up not doing what you want to do. Until you get to the place that you allow Jesus to be in control of your life completely, you're going to be in this conflict of your sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. Until you die out to sin, and die out to living for yourself, and die out to the things of the world, and allow Jesus to be Lord, you're going to fight that battle, and that battle is going to create conflict in your life. The third place where there's a battle going on is in our society. Our society is not a Christian society. Our society is a sinful society. Our society does not promote Christianity and the Bible. Our, our society promotes sin and the values of the world. And in this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said. If you live for God, if you put God first, you will have trouble. People won't like it. They will oppose you. Um, some of them will put you down and try to make fun of you. And that is normal because their values and your values are not the same. So I want you to understand that the spiritual war, the spiritual battle going on is real. It's very real. Satan hates you. He hates your family. He hates our church. He hates our country. And he wants to not just defeat us. He wants to destroy us. There is a conflict between your sinful nature and the Holy Spirit. You have to understand that and come to the place where you die out to yourself and let Jesus be Lord. And then there's a real conflict. That conflict is raging right now in our society between Christianity and sin. It's just raining for who's going to be in control, God or Satan. So once you understand the source of spiritual wars and spiritual battles, then P, you understand. P, prepare yourself to win the battle. You've got to take what the Bible said today, and you've got to prepare yourself to win the spiritual war going on. You've got to prepare yourself to win the battles that you, were in, you will encounter as a Christian. You've got to know what to do. It's not hard. You have to follow 
God's instructions in the Bible. And God's instructions are put on the full armor of God. I would like for you to um, take your piece of paper again and down there where you're writing, you understand spiritual wars, P, prepare yourself to win the battle. Let's make a list of the armor that God told us to put on to win our battles, which me really means develop these characteristics in your life. The first one is hold to the truth. Hold to the Bible. Hold to God's word. Don't compromise your convictions. Don't do part of it and not part of it. Hold to the truth. Live by the Bible. Live by all of it. Put God first in your life. The second thing is be in right relationship with God. A lot of people who claim to be Christians have ongoing sin in their life or they're doing things that are really displeasing to God, and they're not in right relationship with God. They don't have God's blessing on their life. Um, they're not at peace. Um, God is not protecting them. They're calling themselves a Christian, but out here on their own, living for themselves and living in the world and doing their own thing. That's not what a Christian is. A Christian is a person who has accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior, and is doing God's thing all the time. What does it mean to be in right relationship with God? It means to be at peace with God. How can you be at peace with God? To not have anything displeasing to God in your life. To obey 2 Corinthians 7.1. Get anything out of your life that's displeasing to God. In fact, the Lord's putting on my mind a verse that he has shown me a lot in recent months. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it's in verses 21 and 22. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, if you're not guilty of sin, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask from him, we will receive because we keep his commands or obey his commands and because we do what pleases him. So there you have it in a nutshell. If you want to be in right relationship with God, you cannot be guilty of anything displeasing to God in your heart or life, and you have to be obeying his commands and doing what's pleasing to him. So putting on the armor of God is developing these characteristics in your life. The first one is holding to the truth. The second one is being in right relationship with God. The third one is telling people about peace with God. Our world is in turmoil. Our country is in turmoil. Most Americans are in turmoil, and they need to know that when you become a Christian, you will have peace with God, and that peace in your heart will give you peace in your life and help you to have peace in a world full of turmoil. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You can have peace peace with God instead of the conflict or the turmoil that you're in if you'll turn your life over to him and just say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I'm truly sorry for my sins and I confess my sins to you and I ask you to forgive me and come into my heart. I am truly, truly sorry. I repent of my sins and will turn away from them for the rest of my life. If you will pray that prayer genuinely and sincerely, truly accept Jesus as your Savior and turn away from your sins and live for God, you will have peace in your heart and your life. The next characteristic God wants us to build into our lives and develop in our lives is faith. Faith is kind of a nebulous word. 
It's a little fuzzy. Faith means to start with trusting Jesus alone for your salvation. Then after you accept Jesus, it means trusting God to take care of you. And then when you get pretty strong in your faith, it means believing God to do what his word says, and even believing God to work a miracle. You can't be a Christian unless you have faith in God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, excuse me, that's Romans 5, 1, uh, we have peace with God when we accept Jesus because of his gracious gift to us. We have peace with him. So don't forget, you've got to put your faith in God in order to trust him to save you, in order to him to live for you. The next thing God wants you to build into your life is salvation. Being a Christian, living for him, living by the Bible, living according to his word, letting him show you what he wants you to do, following his lead. The next thing God wants you to do is to truly, truly, truly believe that the Bible is the ultimate authority of truth. Statistics say that 53% of the people who claim to be Christians don't believe in moral absolutes. They don't believe that the Bible is the ultimate source of truth, and the Bible is true from cover to cover. Let me tell you, you can't be a Christian and not believe that the Bible is the ultimate source of truth. It is. So I want to encourage you to pray until God helps you to believe that the Bible is the ultimate source of truth, and it's true from cover to cover. That's interesting we would say it that way because prayer is the next characteristic God wants you to build into your life. Research says the average person who claims to be a Christian prays three minutes a day. Three minutes. How much time do you watch television on an average day? How much time do you spend on your computer? either on emails or playing games or whatever that would be. How much time do you spend doing everything else you do in a day compared to spending time alone with God in prayer? Just think about how God does not feel important to so many people who claim to be Christians because they spend hours and hours and hours doing other things and three minutes praying. Make God the number one priority in your life by spending a significant amount of time with God in prayer. <clears throat> I know what I'm telling you because about 20 years ago, God dealt with me about spending an hour a day in prayer. And I can tell you that I've worked at doing that about 90% of the time, and it has changed my life. So I would encourage you to spend more time alone with God in prayer. The last characteristic God wants you to build into your life is perseverance. Um, I would confess to you that I have to work at being a disciplined person. I would confess to you that I have to work at perseverance. The word perseverance means staying true to God no matter what happens. No matter what your mate does. No matter what your children do. No matter what somebody at church does. No matter what your boss does or your company or anything or anybody else. Stay true to God no matter what happens. So there's the list of the characteristics that God wants you to build into your faith and work on becoming strong, holding to the truth, being in right relationship with God, telling people they can have peace with God, faith or trusting God, salvation or being a Christian, the Bible as the ultimate source of truth and the guide for life, prayer 
as communicating with God and getting closer to God and perseverance, staying true to God no matter what happens. So the Bible says, if you will understand spiritual wars and battles, where they come from, the battle between God and Satan, the conflict between your sinful nature and the Holy Spirit, and the conflict in our society between Christianity and sin. And if you will take that understanding and build those characteristics into your life, holding to the truth, being in right relationship with God, telling people they can have peace with God, trusting God, being a Christian, taking the Bible as the ultimate source of truth, spending time alone with God in prayer, and staying true to God, you can win your spiritual battles. There's one last thing that I would like to give you. On your paper, I want you to draw a circle. On that circle, I just want you to draw some arrows going around. At the top of the circle, I want you to write the word commit. Then over here at 3 o'clock on the circle, um, write the word trust. Then down there at 6 o'clock on the circle, write the word delight or derive in parentheses. And then up there at 9 o'clock on the circle, write rest and wait. So commit your life to God. Trust him with your life. Derive your joy in life from your relationship with God. And rest and wait for God when you don't know what to do for him to show you his will. It's called the cycle of victorious living. A guy named Earl Lee developed it. When I go through the toughest times of my life, the deepest waters I ever go through, that's what I do. When I come to the end of myself and I've tried to make it better and it's worse, I stop trying and commit it to God. After I commit it to him, when I get nervous and worried it won't turn out right, I trust him with it and leave it in his hands. While I'm waiting, I work at deriving my joy in life from my relationship with God, not my circumstances. And then the one that's the hardest for me, when I'm waiting for the answer to come, I rest, if it's even possible, relax, take it easy, stop fretting, leave it in God's hands, and wait for God to supply the answer. So, you, understand spiritual wars and battles. P, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself to win the battle. Build those characteristics in your life. And once you get them in your life, work on them until you become strong in them. And then S, stay true to God no matter what happens. No matter how bad it is, how black it looks, how terrible you think it is, stay true to God no matter what happens and he will bring you through. Some of you know me well. Um, some of you don't. Um, some of you know me as your pastor or your former pastor, and some of you just know me as a pastor that you've met on the internet. Either way, that's okay. Either way, I want to tell you that when I'm up front at church and when I'm preaching and when people know me and they see me, um, they think that because I've been a Christian for 55 years, um, they think because my wife is a Christian and my son is a Christian, um, they think because I am a pastor of a really good church with a lot of great people that I've got it all together and I've got it pretty easy, really. And that's just plain not true. I don't have it all together. I make mistakes. I make errors in judgment. I get discouraged. Sometimes I get down. Um, sometimes I feel like giving up and quitting. I want you to know so that no matter where you're at in your life, 
in fighting spiritual battles. I want you to know the devil has tried to defeat me as a Christian and has tried to destroy my relationship with God and came close one time, but God helped me and didn't let him do it. The devil has tried to destroy my marriage and came really close to destroying my marriage and Wanda and I ending up divorced. But God helped me. I didn't do it. God helped me and God did it. I want you to write down 2 Corinthians 3, 5. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 says, our sufficiency is not of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. Not only has the devil tried to destroy my relationship with God and my marriage, the devil has really tried to destroy our church and came that close to destroying our church six, seven years ago. Really close. God didn't let him do it. God stopped him and defeated him and changed our church and has blessed the church and blessed 200 people in an unusual, amazing way. Life's a choice and the choice is up to you. You know that God is trying, excuse me, you know that Satan is trying to destroy our country. You know that. You know he's trying to destroy our country. The only hope our country has is for people who are committed Christians to stay true to God and stand up for what is right. So no matter what you're going through right now, if the devil's trying to destroy your relationship with God or your relationship with your mate or your children or your relationship with your church or trying to destroy your job, or your finances, or your health, I want to tell you, you don't have to be a super Christian. You don't have to be a superhero. You can be a common, ordinary person. But if you love God more than anything else in the world, God can give you the strength to bring you out by the power that he has to defeat everything else, no matter who it is or what it is. God has the power to defeat them and give you the victory. So I want to encourage you, don't give up. Give yourself to God completely. Turn the situation over to God completely. Live by the cycle of victorious living. Commit it to him. When you get nervous, trust him with it. Don't take it back in your hands. Don't try to derive your joy in life from your circumstances or another person. Derive your joy in life from your relationship with God. And whatever you do, don't give up and quit and throw in the towel. Rest. Stop striving. Take some time. Give God a chance. And wait for God to bring you through. Let's pray, okay? Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for your word that we've studied today in Ephesians 6, but we're really thankful for your word in 1 John 4, 4 even as well that says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. We know that you are greater than the devil, and we know the devil already is a defeated foe, and that's why he's fighting so hard to try to defeat us and our families and our churches and our country. But God, if we will allow you to give us the strength and the ability and the power, you can defeat Satan for us and we can win the battle. So I pray you'll be with every single person watching me and even other people who aren't watching us who are fighting battles and help them to understand the source of spiritual battles, to prepare to win those battles by building those characteristics into their lives and by staying true to you, no matter what happens, God, no matter how bad it gets, help them stay true to you and allow you to bring them through. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I hope 
the Lord has helped you today. I hope you'll take your Bible. I hope you'll get it out. I hope you'll study Ephesians 6. I hope you'll look at Psalm 37. I hope you'll look at other verses like uh, 1 John 4.4. 4. I hope you'll remember that 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to strongly support those whose hearts are completely His. God loves you. He's got a great plan for your life, and He can defeat the devil for you and help you to experience what He has for you. Let Him help you have His best. God bless you. Have a great day.